I've known Lee uh, a pretty long time now, slightly, uh, through, uh, through friends in common and, um, and known Lee and, and Leah and just uh, enjoyed hanging out with them a couple of times. And at the same time, I have this other relationship, which still feels like it's sort of in a separate space to, uh, to Sonic Youth and um, who I, you know, I, I first saw when they were, they didn't even have a drummer. I saw them in a tiny little hole in the wall place at like 3 a.m. It might have been really one of their earliest gigs. Lee, Lee confirmed for me that they only played five or six times before they added a drummer. So, I mean, I saw them uh, when no one knew who they were and um, because of the unforgettable name and the unforgettable show, it stuck in my head. And this, and as they emerged and became famous, I was sort of always had this claim of, you know, kind of a street cred that, that fascinated me to, to feel so much kinship. And I also, when I moved away from the East Coast uh, and from the New York, you know, uh, punk scene, which I'd kind of frequented as a teenager, um, that they were now occupying that space, I felt this thread of fascination that they, they were so obviously of this place that I was from and recognized, and what I went to California to do included involving myself in the Philip K. Dick Society, uh, which was the, it was a, basically a couple of people working to cultivate his posthumous reputation at a time when he was forgotten. And, you know, he's so, he's so not forgotten now that it's hard to remember that his, all his books were out of print. But so you were looking for clues that anyone cared. And one of the first great clues was that Sonic Youth used some fragments of lyrics from a Philip K. Dick story or references to a Philip K. Dick story uh, on, um, on a song on, um, I think it's on Bad Moon Rising. So that made me also feel this like little heartbeat of connection or kinship. And then I was just a fan. I mean, the, the second time I saw them play live and the only other time I saw them play live is almost the ultimate opposite of the uh, seeing this three, threesome play in a little hole in the wall uh, at 3 a.m. was I saw them at the San Francisco Cow Palace open for Neil Young. So I was like a see you know a, a head a tiny head in a sea of faces in a classic arena rock show and there they are doing their sonic youth thing and they destroyed <clears throat> some amplifiers and bewildered a lot of neil young fans and i was there you know kind of cheering for them they you know in a way that conquered the world they were now they were rock stars and i was just a, a fan so um <clears throat> when i got to meet lee and leah in in the I guess in the late 90s, when I came back to New York City and hang out with them, I, I had all that in the back of my brain. But it didn't have any place to go. They were just nice people to meet. But, uh, I mean, along with reading Philip K. Dick, and I know this now, both Thurston and Lee are book hounds. They're, they're, they're readers. They're obsessive uh, collectors of books. Uh, Thurston has this insane first editions collection. Uh, at one point we met and he had me sign a whole bunch of books. It was about as nerdy a bibliof bibliophilia kind of moment as you can have. Uh, you know, he was, he was playing the fan with me, which was very sweet. And uh, Lee didn't lay those cards on the table as quickly as Thurston, but he acknowledged that he read the books and liked the books and so then it was, it was just always a pleasant sensation of kind of mutual admiration or acknowledgement you you did something i like that thing and and you dig what i did that's great but it, again it had no place to go it was just a, a tip of the cap or something and um and then he quite wonderfully out of the blue um hit me with an email um, to say he was wondering if I'd ever uh, want to 
consider collaborating on some lyrics with him. He was just, it was like a real tenuous kind of fishing expedition email. And I, I said instantly uh, that that sounded great to me. And he didn't know, I think, that I'd done this a number of times, although of course not exactly this, as it turned out. But <clears throat> I've written lyrics for a few different bands. And the conditions of those collaborations were different at different times. They were friends of mine. Began as a as a as a teenager when I was like the kind of the the guy who wanted to hang out with bands but didn't play an instrument. So I would write some lyrics, right, for my buddies Elliot, who ended up having a band in his twenties uh, in Philadelphia that you know had some local uh, success, and I supplied I don't know the lyrics over the years for eight or ten different songs for him. And um, my friend Philip, who's in a band that's still going called Winter Pills, and actually in Northampton, Massachusetts, you know Winter Pills. I've written a bunch of their lyrics. Uh, I'm getting the thumbs up from your <laughs> camera. So, um, yeah, Jonas, Jonas so I've written a few lyrics with Philip, although he's very he's doesn't really need me. It's kind of an indulgence, but that's been a, a sweet connection for me. So anyway, I was slightly familiar with the mode, and then you know I had this other thing I did on online called the Promiscuous Materials Project. And uh, from the sound of your interest in kind of communitarian art making, you would, you would dig this thing. It's, I basically put s some writings, mostly short stories, online and just said to anyone who wanted to, make a film or a play out of these, they're up for grabs. Yeah, I saw that. No, no, no intellectual property issues, no lawyers, no agents involved, just from me to you. And I also included a scattering of lyrics that I'd written. Some things that I'd written for Philip or Elliot's bands that hadn't panned out, and but I was still intrigued by them, or some other ditties, little, almost like poems that seemed more like lyrics to me. And I just said, anyone who wants to do anything with this, please do. So I'd had some, a little bit of, um, <clears throat> you know, the experience of collaboration and the reciprocity going through that site. So when Lee sent me this, like I say, kind of fishing expedition email. I, I thought, um, great, we'll do, we'll do this thing again, even though it wasn't going to be exactly, there was no clear precedent for it. Uh, and, and then he went on to explain that he had um, this uh, great producer and that they were working with sort of sonic textures that were new for him and that he was very excited about where this might go. And he had pieces of songs. He had, in some cases, he had complete demo tracks, but with lyrics that he was skeptical of, that were like placeholder lyrics. And that in other cases, he was still developing the songs. And so uh, he said, we could work a lot of different ways. Um, again, I just sort of threw him my most... Uh, uh, you know, enabling reply. I said, uh, I'd be happy to to uh, collaborate on lyrics um, by uh, working on the page together, or I can send you some finished lyrics and you can try to fit them to songs, or you can send me demos, even ones with lyrics in place, and I'll rewrite the lyrics or replace them. You know, um, it actually reminded me that made me think of this anecdote that I'd always liked um, about the songwriters in the band Squeeze, Difford and Tilbrook, I think they're called. And one of them is the pure music guy and one of them is the pure lyrics guy. And they'd explained, and I don't know if this remained true for their entire career, but they explained that one of the ways they wrote a lot of their hits early on was that the, the music guy would just... Um, <clears throat> No, it was the opposite. The lyrics guy, excuse me, the lyrics guy would listen to Beatles songs and write a whole new set of lyrics for them. And then he'd pass that lyric to the music guy without, as just as a poem, without saying that what song it related to and say, write a song around this. <laughs> so they had these sort of phantom uh, sounds attached to them that would get replaced. Yeah, so that's kind of a, a little bit of it is kind of exquisite corpse. It's an exquisite corpse thing, exactly. It's not only um, a collaboration, but a kind of a, um, a, a Ulipian, you know, Ulipo, or the, the, that French 
cabal of writers who did all these language games for inventing things. And so we ended up, in a way, throwing each other a lot of different kinds of challenges. He would throw me a finished song and say, I don't like the lyrics, rewrite them or replace them. And so I would have to, it was very interesting in that case because I would have to displace the energy from this voice that was singing, you know, because he's, his, his, his performance would be very persuasive in some ways. I would actually like the lyrics better than he did. So, but I had, I had my assignment. I had to like make them different. Um, there were other cases. I mean, we actually ended up, <clears throat> I think, collaborating all the different ways you can on a song collaboration. There were other cases that were the other end of the spectrum where I, I basically wrote uh, a full lyric with my own melodic idea in some ways in mind, because if you write a full lyric with verse chorus, you end up with a kind of implicit melodic idea embedded in it, even if you're not musical, as I'm, as I'm, as I'm unfortunately not. I, I can't sing or play an instrument, but I would still have an idea of what, it, what the song would sound like once I'd written this whole kind of, you know, it looked like it could be printed immediately on the back of the album, right? It looked finished. And I'd throw that to, to Lee and say, but say nothing about how I thought it should sound. Um, and the thing is, like, if there's rhythms and repetitions and things like that you put in there, and right. you don't know what... Right. Because Lee you, talks about how, you know, <clears throat> stuff dropped in. It's like, yeah. you know, he had music. It's like, oh, it just fell right in yeah. there. And, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, without bragging, I think that as a non-musician, but as an incredible, devoted, and compulsive listener, I end up, I think, when I write with the idea of lyrics, I do embed, in a way, musical ideas. Now, many of them may be received scraps. Some of it's magpie work, right? Like, there are only so many melodies and rhythms, but if you make language, it tends to make those more specific and more exact. And so I'll, you know, I'll end up sometimes thinking, oh, that's a tiny Elvis Costello moment or a, a Dylan moment or a, a Beatle moment here or, a, you know, oh, listen, that's, that's under my thumb, you know, or something will be rustling under the surface of it. And that helps give the lyrics a kind of chewiness that I can feel and hear implicit rhythms in them. So, yeah, there are internal rhymes and things that just, you know, that probably pushed Lee in a certain direction. But what I loved, the best of all, was he was never, um, he never took my, anything I wrote as this kind of sacred, you know, untouchable text. He would then chop, slice, and dice my lyrics again. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's great and that's ideal. And he was, he was submitting them to the pressure of, first of all, of performance, because some things that might charm you on the page, they don't sing. You know, so he was very, uh, he demanded that the things work for him as a performer. And, and that, that brought another kind of pressure to the, to the lines. Even the ones w that I'd worked the hardest on would, would transform um, because of the, the needs of the performer. And, um, and then there were some others where I actually, you know, I look at the result now, or listen to the result now, and I can't figure out who wrote what or even how we got started. It's like he sent me a demo that's very, very bare bones with um, maybe like a title on it and no singing. And I started to throw some ly lyrical content at this demo. And then he would take it and change it a lot and also change the music or, or add layers of texture to the music in the studio. So things were being folded in, sound and and language um, <clears throat> in a very erratic <laughs> uh, sequence that has no that had no system to it, and that's you know those songs are the ones that are um, in a way the most uh, remarkable for me because they don't clearly start on his desk or clearly start on my desk. They just they arrive, and um, and the the development of the sonics you know, the instrumentation or the choices about verse, chorus, verse, chorus, or, or where there is a bridge, those things are happening in 
a kind of a strange push me pull you with the lyrical ideas that are developing. So that's where I, of course, I feel, even though I was doing this all by remote control, I mean, you know, I was a, I was an outlier. I was never in New York. This is all done through emails and MP3 files. But those are the songs where I feel like I was kind of in an alchemical mix uh, with, the, with the group to a certain extent. You know, it seems like you did feel like you were kind of co-writing these things and in some ways you didn't even know in some cases who did what yeah. because of this kind of collage. Yeah, and I'd say every one of the songs feels to me is, is essentially a collaborative thing because they just wouldn't exist. I mean, you know, I can, I can identify lines that are my lines. And there are even a few pieces of language, you know, because I'm a great recycler, and it's been true, especially with this sort of very slow, you know, kind of marginal lifetime's involvement in writing songs with musicians, that I'll generate little couplets or ideas for a song that just sit or just don't stick to something, and then they stick around. So, yeah, it all felt like the results were fundamentally collaborative, which isn't to say I can't go and say, oh, that's my line, or spot some language that I just, I just know my own ear, and I'm like, that's got to be Lee. I, I would never put those five words together, or, or where I just remember. He, he, he had that title and that idea. You know, it, uh, the song New Thing came along. He wanted there to be a song called New Thing, and he had quite a few lyrics already. He was unsatisfied with them, and I worked on them, but that's, you know, that starts with him. But those fine distinctions don't change for me the fundamental collaborative uh, truth of the 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 result. The the uh, gestalt was he wanted to collaborate. I got excited about it, doing it, and everything that results comes. It's only alive. It only knits together. It only reached resolution because of the involvement of both of us. And so those are collaborative songs. In, their, in the most pure sense. Now, you know, in a couple of cases, because I keep this sort of reservoir of weird lyrics or words or images or notions that float around that I use from time to time, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a recycler. I mean, I know that that couplet that in some ways, I mean, it lit Lee up when I first sent it to him and it becomes the heart of one of the songs, that couplet, uh, is there any way I could have known better that telltale heart in the purloin letter is there a chance we could have known at the start the uh, purloin letter the telltale heart I had worked out that weird little rhyme that incorporates the two Edgar Allan Poe titles and just chanted it in my head at some point in my 20s and I'd always thought it was like a song so we're talking about something that was like literally you know poking around in my desk drawers with me glancing at it every once in a while and being like, oh yeah that thing that looks good Oh, what is it? You know, it had no home. It had no destination for upwards of 25 years. <laughs> but it didn't mean anything until it did. You know, it's when Lee latches onto it and it suddenly, it like sticks to something that it means something. It's, it's nothing but a scrap of impulse, really. And he gave it that home. So, you know, it belongs to him now as, as much as it ever did to me. Well, I mean, so... If, you know, <clears throat> I don't want to talk too much in shorthand here, but you know my investment in this idea. If you've looked at the Promiscuous Materials site or you've read my writing where I express my admiration for Lewis Hyde's The Gift and for this idea that there is a kind of innate, uh, you know, anti-intellectual property uh, ingredient in creativity, that there's a way in which, you know, Art rises away from individual makers and starts to connect people in uncanny ways that can't be accounted for by simple proprietary notions. And I'm infatuated with that idea and, and, and that, that truth that I see running through the world of culture, you know, the way... Uh, the way artistic results belong to everyone and no one. They belong to their listener. They belong to 
the drummer who sat in on one track, and it's just it's an alchemy of involvement. Now that said, there are art forms that exemplify this, and others that seem to, you know, relatively kind of um, hide this truth. <laughs> it's only smuggled in. As a novelist, most of the time I go around, you know, accepting and even benefiting from the image of the novelist as a sort of Promethean, solitary creator who comes down from the mountain and unveils this marvelous result. You know, I made it. I wrote every word. At the other end, you have something like, you know, the uncanny fact of, you know, um, commercial or folk art objects, vernacular art objects like the, you know, mid-century American comic book where the guys are making it were just hired by these cynical businessmen and one guy inks it and one guy writes it and they might have, you know, been handling a character that someone else invented two years before who they didn't even invent. But something happens, right? It's like, who made that? Who's the artist? Who's the auteur? And, you know, the Hollywood film, studio film, often presents the same conundrum. It's like, why is the conversation... Uh, Francis Ford Coppola's greatest film. Is it because Walter Murch really made it, you know, in the editing room? Or is it just, you know, is Gene Hackman the genius? Like, what's, what, where is the alchemy? Um, it's everywhere and nowhere. Uh, and rock and roll, you know, presents this trick, this, uh, this mystery, often in the most direct kind of way. I mean, you, you could just think of it as like the Beatles perplex, right? Like, there was a thing that was the Beatles that was bigger than any of these four guys and just existed when they were in the room. And, you know, <clears throat> um, people making one another bigger and creating artworks that are bigger than any of th their own possible creative selves could account for. That's the, it's a kind of a dream of, <clears throat> you know, human beings forming like a kind of gestalt uh, entity, right, is the rock band. So to to get to move from my dubious, imperial, novelistic self, you know, always alone, always credited, always stuck in the isolation, always credited with being solitary and for better or worse, and to get to alchemize in the, in the you know, uh, a little bit. I mean, now, you know, Raul, I've still never met Raul. So it all flows through Lee here at least from my perspective. But, you know, when you said, he's, it's not doesn't seem like a singer-songwriter thing, I think, well, Lee came of age as a creator in uh, Beatles. You know, Sonic Youth was a greater than the sum of its parts. At You know, at its best, they, they activated higher parts of one another, and probably they look at their albums and they're like, where did that come from? Was that me? Was that you? What was it? Well, the answer is, you know, the same mystery that we're trying to evoke. Well, you know, you touch on so much. I mean, the, um, you know, I, I write these copious, you know, uh, no, novels are in a way the, the most super extensive art form, right? I mean, even compared to a feature film, just the, the number of, sentences, <laughs> the number of paragraphs and scenes and situations. You know, anyone who's ever tried to adapt a novel to feature film, even if they grant themselves, you know, like, oh, we're going to make a three-hour film, you cut, you cut, 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 cut. So I am a running off at the mouth guy. No one tells me to shut up. I just fill every available space with description and explanation, and I, you know, I, I, um, I evoke by by overload, right? I just say everything about about what I mean. <laughs> well, a pop song is is a total, you know, it's like a Zen koan by comparison, or at least it's a sonnet. You know, it's it's not even a sonnet. It's really language wise. It's it's a series of scraps, a, little semaphore signals, and so you know, the first thing that I have to defeat is my desire to, you know, um, even write, you know, complete sentences. <laughs> um, and, uh, but that's a great, a great game. It's really fun to just, uh, switch to, um, 
you know, flares in a darkened landscape, language flares, and um, see what you can evoke with these with these little bits of uh, signal. But there's also the music. I mean, your your words are not alone. They're they're riding this. They're like you know, almost like um, passengers in the song. They're they they've got this incredible privilege of being, um, you know, um, motorized and and animated and and you know, uh, pixelated by the the sound, and sometimes there's very little they have to do except just provide the occasion um, for for a, an experience that actually is not about the language. So it's humbling. Um, and freeing at the same time because you can be, uh, you know, at times it was really about like um, taking out the fanciest or most interesting thing I'd I'd thought to write down in favor of the thing that Lee could sing and that got out of the way of the guitars. That just was like, um, you know, it's like a homeopathic tincture of language that makes the song <laughs> come to life. Well, it's funny, too, because you're saying, like, some of the lyrics you like that Lee had done, and Lee, you know, we have it in the film, too. I mean, a lot of cases, he's just making stuff up on the spot. Well, that's but it. making things that sound right. You know, you know he's, he's, he's an experienced singer of, of good rock songs, right? And so when he does what he thinks are just dummy lyrics... And he's just basically syllab syllabalizing along with his track. He actually arrives, you know, in some pretty interesting places. You know, it's like I think the kind of process that Brian Eno would ratify. That you know, I mean, he he goes, Eno goes too far, and I think he's being a provocateur when he says that lyrics don't matter at all. They're just sounds in the song. But he's catching something, which is that they are partly just sounds in the song, and. Um, and that they're best arrived at by nonsense procedures. Well, that may also be exaggerating. I think that you know Lee arrived at some amazing ones by what he thought were kind of an absent-minded procedure. But usually, language drifts into meaning. Associations are, you know, our minds are giant machines for producing associations. So you know, the problem with um, trying to generate pure nonsense or vacate language of meaning, as you know, any experimental poet has discovered, John Ashbery or you know, or anyone who's tried to vacate, you know, Gertrude Stein or the, the Dada poets, the language floods back in by a series of inevitable associations. Lang like words themselves are, you know little metaphor machines. They're, they're, they're loaded up with the stuff. They just produce meaning. So Lee did it in his placeholder lyrics. He would sing along just to have something there to sing. And yeah, we had, th had to throw some of that out. But some of that, I just helped him embrace. <laughs> I mean, there's a couple of songs where I think I sent him back like 80% of his own language with just me almost kind of doing like carpentry or... Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd concentrate around the edges of these uh, lyrical results that he'd produced uh, as placeholders. And, and some of that you spent listening You know, you've to probably heard the finished results yeah. more than I have. Yeah. I, I still, um, you know, I'm like, a, a, it's like an iceberg relationship. The finished album is this little thing poking out of the water, and I'm still... You know, I listen to different demos of different tracks over and over and over again so many times, and I still have to accustom myself to the place they they all f finally landed, yeah. the polished up um, results. Aware in cyberspace. Yeah, no, it was very, it was very, you know, um, it was very sweet to get the next round of things, and very exciting to just listen to stuff. I mean, there were times, and I was taking it with me wherever I was. I actually wrote one of the songs in Australia during the Sydney Writers' Festival, and there's this feeling you have in, like, a foreign city if you bring a, you know, an iPod. So Lee sent me, like, a new uh, demo he was excited about. I can't remember which one it was. And I just put it on repeat and walked around a strange city, you know, with a feeling of, 
uh, delightful, that absurd freedom you feel when you've just exited your life for a few days and you, your only responsibilities are to like, you know, eat out with other writers and do one panel presentation and otherwise you're just like, you know, getting away with murder, uh, in, in, you know, while, while, while someone else takes care of your kids. And I was just walking around listening and tripping out on this amazing, you know, so, you know, and I didn't even want to write lyrics to it <laughs> for a couple of days. I was like, I just want to walk around Sydney and just listen to this track, which was like for me, for my ears only in a way. I mean, obviously Raul had heard it and probably it, it might have landed in some other inboxes, but it was like, in a way it was like for me. And I just was... You know, I was the listener and the and the recipient and the accomplice, and um, and I could just think, okay, I'm going to make this into something, but not yet. I'm just going to walk around by the by the Sydney waterfront and and listen to it. Um, and uh, you know, at the same time, it was you know the whole project w was calling to a part of me that's um, an editor and a craftsperson and a you know, kind of a word carpenter. And sometimes it was like homework. You know, Lee would send me uh, the the song back with like three lines in red and say, I need I need better lines to sing here. It's something that scans exactly the same as these three things, but is different. And I'd be like, oh, geez, all right, what is this supposed to be? You know, it was like a little piece of Sudoku, word Sudoku for me, <laughs> arriving in my inbox on a busy morning when I was supposed to be grading papers. So it went everything, it, 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 it filled the gamut from, you know, um, very trippy, unusual, uh, exalted kind of challenges to, I'm, you know, I felt like I was sort of his word caddy at times, and it was just like, fix this, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess, um, <clears throat> I mean, unmistakably, I come from both of those places, but I also um, resist the image of it as... Um, uh, simply polarized, you know, because in fact, uh, you know, so my father's a painter, my mother was an activist, and also a, I've, I've, I've joked that the only right word for her is a bon vivant. She was a talker and a, you know, a, a hippie socialite. She just loved to, you know, her kitchen table was sort of where it was at, and people came to her and our house was a was alive with voices and and personalities and happenings because of her magnetism my father was a painter and in some ways characteristically like the artist off in the high ivory tower he literally his studio was on our top floor and he's from the midwest and is a little bit more of a withdrawn quiet uh person with, with a great need for solitude uh, and, and paints, uh, you know, um, paints on canvas. It's a kind of, a, again, this Promethean, the image of the Promethean artist who just is a solitary inventor. But just behind the apparent, you know, binary image there, well, my dad's actually been political his whole life. He was the one who um, in, in, at some levels, drove our family into a, a life of protest and and involvement. He became a Quaker uh, peace activist, and and uh, you know, long after my mother was gone, his his political commitments, his community commitments, uh, gave a lot of the shape to my experience of our family growing up. And my mother was something of an esthete. She was. A uh, huge reader could be a bit uh, snobbish about the life of the intellect and literacy, and um, and uh, and she was a you know bohemian. She 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 liked late night bull sessions and um, was in some ways the the less responsible. You know she had a, an instinct for justice and for activism and for movements, but she was also a kind of a uh, a bit of a, a lounge lizard. So in both of them, there this kind of the two properties are are combined and mixed in different ways. And in fact, my dad's art life itself became in the '70s, especially very 
communal. You know, we lived in a communal home, and he painted from the figure, which meant there were people in his studio automatically. And often, he was he was very involved in a drawing group where the artists would take turns modeling for one another. So it's like that weird kind of, you're on one side of the canvas, you're on the other side of the canvas. Um, and he began painting images of the drawing group. So he was literally painting fellow his fellow painters and the model in the same room at the same time. So there's a kind of a, a mixture of the world of social, a, a, a kind of sociality to his studio, where there were lots of other people there, and where he he himself was breaking down some of the solitary image of the artist. And he's he remains actually very very politically committed. It's a big part of his life is protest and and um, peace activism and anti death penalty activism and. Um, so for me, the two things seemed entangled rather than being like off apart from each other and you can kind of go to one and then you've abandoned the other. They just seemed like they were, um, a big mess in the middle of kinds of involvement in life that were, you know, as a kid for me, obviously overwhelming, attractive, dismaying, you know, I had to sort through like anyone else has to sort through the world that they come of age inside and find out how to make it my own and, and what parts to, you know to push aside to make space for myself but I think I've always accepted that um, uh, the two things were implicated maybe they were they could superficially be isolated from one another, one another but in practice living a life as an artist you were political and you know that the two things just uh, stuck stuck to each other. But also that it was a, a little bit of a team sport too. You know, yeah. It's not. Uh, you know, yeah, absolutely. I I you know I mean I guess I've you know I didn't become a filmmaker. I didn't have the musical chops to be in one of my friend's rock bands. So I didn't end up with one of these kind of innately collaborative mediums, and that speaks to part of me. I think I have parts of myself that are very solitary and uh, maybe even somewhat imperial in that creative way of like I like to go and control everything I like that my novels are you know I, I I'm I'm the casting director and the cinematographer and the you know the I, I do everything I like I like creative control in my books so I don't, it's not that I don't see the attractiveness of that but I also as I've gone to great lengths to say and you know in that essay the ecstasy of influence especially I think that the life of a writer is a life that just underneath that solitude involves other voices. You're reading, intertextuality is baked in. Other people's writing, uh, a conversation is, is you know, um, is it, it's Im implied. You write to be read by people and you are a reader and and the voices are all clamoring and connecting in the middle yeah it's funny I I feel um, more um, I'm, I'm fascinated but I'm also more mystified by the uh, recipient connection with these songs in terms of my making them and them going out into the universe, I feel like it's so brokered through Lee and his audience and the expectations. That, you know, I mean, I, there's a set of terms that comes out of um, uh, the, the the science of of drug use in the '60s, set and setting. That you know, what happens when you take LSD has is contextual. It has to do with the internal context you bring to it and the external context with which you enact this encounter, right? So as a novelist, I think I'm fairly conscious of how, you know, I make something and then the set and setting, you know, it's not all under my control by any measure, but I can think about it kind of capably, right? Like the setting is partly, you know, oh, you know, novels are supposed to be serious, and sometimes I want to play into that, sometimes I want to play against that. 
you know, it's supposed to be a high art form, but I tend to try to make it, drag it down and make it more low <laughs> or more, a little more, um, you know, capricious or, or um, uh, you know, rooted in some sort of vernacular energy, you know, connected to comic books or rock and roll in some way. But I'm playing against the expectation that novels are sort of serious and uh, high art, right? And, you know, and then part of it, as I've accumulated books and I myself am in, you know, my reputation or the image of me as an author is in the mix. I know that my books are playing off against one another. That's part of the setting. And, I mean, I kind of can think about how my, my reader recipient might most likely be... Uh, be predisposed to feel or think as they as they open one of my books. So, but the set and setting for Lee's record is like exotic to me, several degrees of remove from anything I can really. Uh, it's not like your children you're sending out into the. World. Yeah, it's very just it's like very much like I just I helped him make this thing and I, you know I can think about it but I almost think about it more like I'm a fan like I'm gonna I really feel like you know. One day I'm going to buy this record. I mean, I'd like to get a free copy. I hope, hope you can arrange for that. But um, and I then I'll start to be able to think about what it is that I happen to participate in. But it's like until I see it in a record store and listen to it as a fan, I'm not going to really get what it was I did <laughs> or what it means. I've heard I've heard some final tracks. Yeah, I'm very interested. And I and of course there are also there are songs on the record. You know, I mean, I I'm I'm of the generation that still like believes in the album as a creative unit you know I mean I think people younger than than us have maybe a, a a more tenuous sense of what it is to like make an album you know I mean you have the idea that like someone drops a whole bunch of their new stuff but a lot of songs uh, come free of their their context as individual you know so it's like almost like back to 45s or something um, and I th I think one of the things that's like a huge unknown for me is the music that uh, I didn't touch on here, <laughs> because it's not like I'm I'm I have a fingerprint, even a fingerprint on every single song on the record, and so how how those things connect and 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 commune with the ones that I worked on is an, is a mystery to me, uh, but um, yeah I I mean I'm really proud of it it's you know it, it tends up being like a I mean the image of the artist fooling around outside their proper arena can be a very silly one or very awkward one you know it's like Sylvester Stallone exhibiting his oil paintings right and um, sometimes it has a kind of a bogus feeling uh, I think for for people like why are you doing that I have you over here in my mind you know how could you possibly think you'd be good at that in any important way you know why 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 does someone as established as Lee Ronaldo need help well you know if you approach it from all sorts of um, angle skeptical angles it could seem sort of indefensible or like an indulgence or like you know one of these uh, annoying things where semi-famous people like to hang out with other semi-famous people and why should I have to, you know, honor that with my, my, my uh, earnest attention. But it really, it happened because of a kind of a, a playful openness on his part and uh, a sense of um, curiosity on, you know, on both our parts. And what began to happen was its own thing. It just was its own thing. Now, I don't, it doesn't mean that I can like stand behind it uh, with the kind of authority. Like, you should, you should check me out. I'm a hell of a songwriter. I just have been, you know, hiding all this time behind this other identity as a novelist. It's not like that claim is being made. It's more like I just really was a sort of half witness, half enabler, half you know gadfly or or provocateur. And, and a cobbler sometimes of language for, for, for a project that I was, you know, party to. I was like a participant, listener, you know, um, fan who got to like kind of 
put my fingers into the mix, you know, taste the batter when it was uncooked. Um, and it was just a cool, unique, particular thing, possibly unrepeatable, you know? Uh, I mean, I guess I, I, I bring to it uh, kind of a, a fairly uh, resilient sense by now that novels, as I, as I write them, are also meant to be part of the popular idiom. And that I've gotten to dabble, you know, by writing lyrics once or twice before, by writing a comic book for Marvel Comics, which I did for a, like a 10-issue run. Um, you know, by writing for a magazine. You know, I've written profiles that were in Rolling Stone. There's, there's a way in which I just don't feel that I've made some exotic uh, um, transmigration to another realm, but that at least from the position of the maker, that all the stuff has a lot in common. And that, um, you know, I dig this kind of artifact, I make that kind of artifact, and oh, today I made this kind. But that it's a bunch of stuff made by people out of enthusiasm and, and who, who revel in, you know, um, music, film, books as uh, not stuck in these various quarantines or only for certain kinds of use, but as available for pretty much anyone to grab onto as a, as a taker or a maker who, who cares for them, who, who, who is turned on by them. And so um, I don't feel like I had to step across some, some uh, difficult boundary to place myself in this in this role, I just was sort of like, yeah, I've made different things, and now I'm, what a surprise! I'm sort of part maker of one of these kinds of things. Lucky for me, yeah. lucky for me. You know, Did Lee know. tell you things about what he had in mind with new thing? That was a, a song that Lee was really afraid was going to end up on the nose. Like he had some lyrics, and he had the title. It was very definite that this was the title, and it was like a concept. And at the same time, I think he was. Um, trepidatious about how specific he was being, so it was an it was an odd, odd, uh, um, it was an odd lyric to work on because I almost felt that Lee wanted it not to be what it was about, or to be told it was okay that it was <laughs> it was a, that it was what it was about, which was kind of like the internet. And, and so I think I helped him universalize it. You know, it's a weird thing to think, let's make, you know, it's generally the case in art that you, you benefit from making things more specific or, um, or, or uh, eliminating uh, stray signifiers or fog, ambiguity. right? Well, but not ambiguity. Ambiguity is good because it allows things to float in. You know, I mean, there's the, I can't remember whose joke this is, but it's like Neil Young's Long May You Run is a really good song right up until the day you find out it's about his car. And then it's a really boring song, right? Like the freedom to read it in multiple ways, that's not, a, that's not actually obfuscation or evasiveness. That's a kind of a, a creative tool that you can employ. And um, in the, I'm not a poet, but I was laboring over this poem at one point, and I was really, I mean, it's just, for some reason, I was just intent on working out this idea I had in terms of a poem. And someone smarter than me said, what's wrong with this poem is that it says what it's about. The title gave, gave the name of the subject, and then the subject was referred to. And they said, this poem is pretty much ready to go if you, if you take the title off and use pronouns in places of the noun that is the heart of the subject. And now I don't know that it's like a great poem now, but it suddenly made it into something that worked because the um, specificity was everywhere except at the center. And I think in a way that's what we did to the new thing, which was one of Lee's most deliberate lyrics. It was one of the most developed when he handed it off to me, and yet he was very uh, uncomfortable with what it had had gotten, what it had become already. 
And so I, I think we worked on it in that spirit. <laughs> in a way, it's very sincere. Mm -hmm. and it still feels... Fe it's not you still you hear very much. Right. It's, that kind right. Of, uh, it still feels like the song he gave me in terms of its... what it reaches to say. It just doesn't close down the meaning. Right. Yeah. But the sincerity in the... Um, in, in its, in its um, gesture, in its, in its striving, and in the way he puts it across, is really so rich. It, on yeah. the, maybe on the other end of the spectrum, you have a song like Uncle Skeleton, which, yeah. you know, which is like jump cuts from yeah. you know, one thing to another. There's yeah, well, I'm really happy with that one, and it, it connects. You know, so one of the things I let myself do, because anything that works is good, was I borrowed some energy in a couple of places specifically from the um, actual subject matter of the novel I was working on in the background. My, my, my predominant activity in the period of time when I was sporadically writing lyrics with Lee was to try to do what I do when I'm writing a novel, which is add every day substantially to this giant project. And I was in the grip of that. So that was most, most of where my brain was. So there were times when there'd be a floating piece of language or an image or a, just a motif from the novel. And when I heard one of Lee's demos or, or heard a demo that had some language attached to it, energy from my novel would seem to want to stick to it. I would just say, all right, let's, what happens there? So, you know, um, I was writing, my book includes a very grim s sequence with surgery in it. And... And in in a more general sense, it's um, it's got this idea about uh, bodies and about the surface versus the inside, and so this phrase you've got to take the flesh off, you know. Um, a lot of what I did with that lyric was put in, <clears throat> you know, take um, take the idea of the skeleton, which which Lee had and uh, develop it in, a, in, a, in ways that, in my mind, are associated with my, my own book. I don't even know if he knows that. Um, and uh, the fact that at one point I think the skeleton is um, playing cards, you've got to let the skeleton win, that comes from the fact that my book is about a gambler who undergoes this hideous surgery and his, his face is more or less taken off uh, by the surgeon. Um, and... Um, this whole problem of uh, living with the skeleton inside, obviously, the figure of death is inside us, uh, waiting to come out, um, connects it very strongly to my own book. But that's, you know, I don't know how important that, it certainly didn't seem important at the time that I mentioned that to Lee. I just found energy there and began developing lyrics that seemed to do something on their own. And I th threw them back at him, you know. Yeah, so um, thrown over the wall was was another one where Lee had developed a very extensive set of images and and uh, dummy lyrics that I found uh, more intriguing than I think he meant me to. I think he was sort of proposing I replace everything, and but I always think. I always felt when that process would happen that he was more attached to what he'd sung than he knew. <laughs> and um, so I, I, would, I would offer them back to him and it was like once they'd been sanctified by my uh, carpentry, my tailoring, it's more like tailoring, like I'd take the inseam, you know, uh, he would embrace them and sometimes become very adamant about them. Like they'd, they'd they'd accomplished more than he realized. Um, and I don't know what thrown over the wall means. I mean, that's a great example of my being able to work a lot on a lyric that I, I can't, he didn't like lay a card on the table and say, here's what I'm trying to say. And I don't think I ever understood it in literal terms, but I could still work on it. <laughs> you know, that's again, a little bit where the like, um, some of the Dada procedure comes in. A little bit of that exquisite corpse comes in. You can improve language and add to language 
that you don't identify with or even grasp if you're confident enough to to try and I, I think that's a song where I got myself in that position where I was like I, I'm not sure what Lee wants but I, I could do this to this let's see what he says <laughs> do you see these songs as uh, there's a lot of things in the lyrics that are kind of archaic in a kind of nice way like <laughs> There's aeroplanes, and right. even the lyric, which I think Lee wrote, right. Lauren, maybe you're calling, I don't know if you're at this, still at this number. Right. That's not a... That's not a yeah, the way, the way technology or... begins to age things, and uh, yeah. But in a way yeah. that I think it may be appealing, because, yeah. you know, writing about texting each other, oh, did she text me? I mean, that's a whole other yeah. thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Do, do you think there's a, a time that these things exist in, or uh, in some ways they seem to hearken back to... Uh, I would say, 60s, 70s, you know... Probably and... that's right. I mean, um, the, the the idiom it probably reveals, you know, even there are very specific, like these kind of technological references or media references. Um, you, you know, at a certain point, things are native to you and other things, you get old enough and certain things can't become native to you. Like, I can think about film... You know, as not only as itself, but as a metaphor for other things. The even the just the somatic reality of like celluloid running through sprockets on a reel, right? That to me has a tangible meaning because I've lived with it. That I'm never going to be able to uh, develop or generate around something that's popped into the world more. More and, recently, and young people have no reference like that. Yeah, at all. So yeah, they're, 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 yeah. So that's sort of what it is. You are at a certain point. You are who you are. You are of a time. Um, I didn't think twice about it, uh, although um, you did remind me that I could that uh, that there's a, a point. There's a point of origin for the um, the aeroplanes uh, lyric. It begins with, um, as sometimes my my thinking does, it begins with an absurd reaction to something that flashes in front of me, a newspaper headline or a something on the radio that someone says that sounds surreal, unexpectedly surreal to me. And there was an there was an image in the New York Times, a headline. Uh, that somebody at the Pentagon had asserted uh, China may be using the sea to hide their submarines. I was like, well, <laughs> or maybe they're just submarines. Like, th using the sea to hide... First of all, the idea of using the sea for anything struck me as this weird, like, uh, you know, human-centric, you know. And so I just, I just blurted out, oh, yeah, and they're using the sky to hide their airplanes. You know, like, I just flipped it. Because because I wanted to catch or present to my wife that morning how funny I thought using the sea to hide your submarines was. And that became the the start of that lyric. The Chinese are so clever. Yeah. Yes, Those so devils, clever. they're using the sea to hide their submarines. As the, as the, the, uh, the West Coast language-only outlier, I'm like the worst evidence for... Uh, you know, I mean, I was not attending Black Mountain College. I was not in Paris at the time. I was like, I was the guy who, the, you know, the, you call on the telephone, right? But um, email, it was mostly email. Uh, but in principle, you know, I mean, one of the compelling things about the project, as I grasped what it meant to Lee, was how... It was this um, transactional uh, experience in the stu in the studio explorations um, with his producer that he wasn't seeing this record in terms of I want to make something I went and found a producer who will enable me to make it. It was like he'd been already captivated by something outside of his own framework or expectation. <clears throat> Um, so he was even even though he was the hub of the wheel 
that he he was already in a in partly in a, a responsive transaction that there was this something going on and he was like I don't know exactly what this will be uh, because I'm not totally in control of it you know so um, I like the sound of that and I you know I can't help project that uh, he's at some level conscious or semi-conscious or unconscious you know thinking about uh, the the conditions of his becoming, which were within a band. I mean, you know, Lee is sometimes kind of the George Harrison of, he's not credited with the bulk of the tracks on the Sonic Youth records, and yet he's totally integral, right? So, you know, uh, that probably is in the mix, too, that he really hungers for, uh, you know, which, which is something I identify with. I, I have that same appetite. 